relevant to speak both to the small and to the big. So thanks for having me. I can go really quick through this. Um, usually I have to start with Mondo Wa, because Mondelez doesn't necessarily uh, ring as the first entity that folks think about um, when you talk about CPG or major companies. But um, thank you for the uh, shortcutting us there. It's Mondelez. Uh, whoops, there it is. Uh, on October 1st, 2012, there was two companies, so what was once Kraft General Foods became Kraft, which is our North American grocery business, and there's Mondelez, which is our global snack business, and it went from 26 categories to five, and we were the five. So even though they're both, lay, uh, both roughly $35 billion, um, this was uh, five, five categories, and that was the 20. So the idea is on the split by decoupling, you're gonna create shareholder value, you're gonna be able to be a lot more agile, um, and in a category like snack, where the growth rates are much higher than some of the more mature categories, in something like a craft, the idea is, you know, really we can create shareholder value in splitting. So that's, um, that's what happened. They definitely called us the, uh, the world's biggest startup, because really, when you slice something like that down the middle, you lose your ideologies, you lose your process, you lose a lot of the thought leadership you lose who you were. So it's been two years in and we're really still a baby. We are still a startup in many sense, but we have a lot of bricks and mortar, which I'll talk to in a little, in a little bit. So in terms of, some folks need to be a little bit grounded on, on where we are. Uh, we talked about the size, but about 80% of our revenues are coming from outside of North America. So we are here as, as North America, specifically the Biscuit Group, which is about 80% of that. So it's very material, but we are still, again, just a small piece 
of, of what Mondelez <coughs> is, what Mondelez is globally. There we go. Um, so our products are in about 165 companies, or not companies, that'd be countries. Uh, and we have share leadership in biscuits, chocolate, candy, and beverages. And then we're number two in gum and coffee. We have 100,000 employees, et cetera, et cetera. And some of the brands you can see here, they're all open. So if you get hungry, inspect, just come up and grab it. <laughs> no problem. We do uh, it all the time. So this is, this is who we are. Not necessarily, I wouldn't read that as agile, um, but yet uh, we, we have to be because you have uh, the only way to create growth and create shareholder value is to get new products in the market that are incremental to what you already have today. So that is that is our inherent challenge. So we have founders. Well, usually when you see a startup and a founder, they look a little more hip, got great shoes, great pants. These guys, I think these guys were very hip in their time. Like, um, <laughs> they were, they were. I mean, the beard, again, we see that we're seeing that now. So, um, no, in all seriousness, they were, they were renegades in their time. But if you think about where we are, we're birthed here in 2012, this is where it started back in you know, 1899, 1999. And a lot of these are all um, acquisitions. So M&A is a core part as a, a major CPG of how we grow. So we still look at, we, within our innovation group, we are still responsible for M&A recommendations. What do you see? What do you buy? The reality is m and is not easy as a major core. Because if I need to turn on tomorrow someone to produce a billion Oreos, there's not a lot of people have that excess capacity hanging around. Oh, you need a billion? Okay, I can get that for you, no problem. So uh, you need to build plants, you need to build, um, you need to have incredible capital if we're doing a new product. That could be a $50 million, $75 million investment before you even get it out the door. So if you think about it from the eyes of, you know, your the C-suite and the CEOs, they're going like, I need to know this product is going to win before I commit $75 million to go build that infrastructure, and I need to know that that product is going to exist in six or seven years from now to make that investment prove out. So the burden of making sure that your product is going to survive um, and be relevant um, is, is a big one. So the pressures and the, and the questioning and the assault you get as you try to kind of push those new products out the door is a lot. So um, that's just a little bit of um, who we are and how we how we got there. Um, I like these images for a couple of reasons. One is this is I don't know about you guys, but this is how I feel every day. I'm like, come on, it's <laughs> us. This is the new this is the new product to the infrastructure of what is you know the rest of the company. Because you think about it, the only reason we have been successful is that you figure out how to do something and you do it consistently and the same very well over and over and again one country after another. And Oreo is the same here as it is in, well, it's getting to be, as it would be in China, as it would be wherever. And we figured out how to do that in a, like with a science. So the minute you say, you know, Oreo, I'm thinking a little bigger. I'm thinking not a box, I'm thinking a bag. Well, that is, that is revolution because you have literally a world of bricks and mortar that's built to do it a certain way. And you're saying to grow that I don't really have proof that this is going to succeed, but I want you to shift everything you've always known and try something else. So that is inherently a challenge. So yes, there's a startup mentality and there's a lot of energy to get out there and to get incremental growth, but you do have a few things kind of holding you uh, to the ground, uh, tethering you, and that is history, mortar, uh, and scale. And the biggest challenge I have is clicking the slides. Let's give it a go. All right. So this is an unauthorized guide to innovating in the real world. I've not, despite they asked, the, uh, I have not shared this with our um, PR folks, because again, in a major company, you need to have this vetted, and it would have gone to, I don't even know how many people. When you see the photos, you'll think, this is getting nowhere. So sometimes you have to break the rules, and it starts with this being an unauthorized guide. So all the Mondelez people, you were sm sworn to silence. None of this goes anywhere. Um, again, I don't think nudity would be sanctioned, for example. But um, the reason um, we have to break a few rules is because the momentum is against us. This is us. This is a new one, a uh, little guy trying to beat uh, what is the infrastructure. So this is going to be very lighthearted, very casual. It may seem very obvious. Don't panic. If at the end you haven't learned anything, that's what the Q&A is for. You can really grow us and try to get something else. <laughs> but um, uh, try to keep it a little bit general so it might be relevant to most. Okay, so the first is embrace uncertainty. Like, uh, yeah, seems kind of obvious. It, I've found it hasn't actually been obvious because folks that have been very successful in established businesses and they come into innovation, they go, I get it figure out the problem, I get the path, I do my research, and then I go for the finish. And then it's all about getting to the finish. 
The challenge is you do that in innovation and you lo lose sight when your ground is changing be you know, beneath you, um, you lose the plot before you get to the end. So sometimes it's better to drop the plot to change the course, and that is what's the most important about getting innovation out the door, and not just doing the process well. So whatever you thought you knew when you started the product or the whatever, uh, you'd have to rethink that. So um, the good thing about uh, working in innovation is the timelines, at least for us, are 24 to 36 months out, uh, and that's on a, what we would call an adjacent product, so something that's pretty close, pretty near it, not a complete reinvention, not a food that's you know, speaking to you, something that you can fair, you know, recognize. Um, so in that time, the likelihood of it changing hands uh, during that course of time is, is very likely. So the good news is you have new eyes. You're sweating it. You're looking at it from different angles. Um, but uh, you need to make sure that culturally you're getting folks into this notion that uncertainty is OK and challenge is absolutely imperative. So that is kind of the first grounding of how, uh, what you need to do to get innovation going. The second is um, scratch the itch or nail the problem. This was uh, a learning, again, doesn't seem obvious, but was a learning because we first, first I have from a marketing background and came into innovation, and there's a lot of people showing me products. And they're like, this is a fabulous product. It's really great. Look at it. It's beautiful. Like, it really is. Who's it for? I'm like, I don't know, but we've got a lot of capacity, and it can make this. Or uh, it's really good, and the guys are just fooling around the lab. And isn't, this, isn't this awesome? Um, I'm like, it is great, but I'm just not sure who's going to buy it. And it's staggering the number of resources that you can get, that you can get behind a, a problem or, or a product, and it actually hasn't started with the consumer endpoint. It starts with, I have a technology, or I have an ingredient, or I have a need, or I have whatever, but if you don't know what the problem is, you don't have anything that anyone will buy. So um, that's... That's a truth that I know we've lived um, time and time again, and you know that it comes up daily. Uh, we have capacity in Plant X in Idaho. I'm like, fantastic, <coughs> but no one needs capacity in Idaho. They need to know that it's going to be something that's meaningful for them. So we need to continue to remind ourselves before we go off and we chase questions that are being asked of us organizationally. Second is orbit the hairball. So this is us, innovation, or we're trying to be. And this is the organization called everything else. This is called the math infrastructure, the 34 billion of existing business that's already out there. That is the hairball. Uh, when you're in it, it's funny because it's very warm, it's very comforting, it feels like a hug, like we're all in this together. Uh, but when you're trying to break out and actually do something that's different, living in the hairball is really suffocating. You're like, oh my god, I can't do anything, nothing's happening. So this distance, separating yourself out from what's happening in the mainline business is really, really important. So as it's turned out, um, the team of us, are, a lot of us are ba based here in Toronto, but the business, the center of gravity is in East Hanover in New Jersey. So 93% of the business is in New York, and your leaders of innovation are in Toronto. And by the way, there's some travel policies that you have to work through. So how does that work when you have product labs, you have all your R&D resources, you have all your manufacturing sites, everything is in the US. So how does that work? The funny thing is, again, this is one of the things reading Lean Enterprise and reflecting back, you go, oh, well, we may not be in a sexy building on the other side of town living this disassociation and trying to incubate as an independent unit, like a breakthrough innovation group, like a Lean Principal would tell you, but we are still managing to orbit in this funny way, because we're not sucked into the day to day. I get pissed off every now and then someone says, you know, I can't believe you didn't bring me into that conversation or I missed that. But you know what? 99% of the time, I'm not dragged into what's going to deliver the number tomorrow. And I'm not brought into a lot of the things that would keep us from keeping an eye on three or five years out. So it actually really worked. That was a bit of an aha for me. I'm like, I'm, you know, instead of feeling on the outside, the outside is actually healthy distance. So the other 75% of the team is sitting in the US, which is great because they're, the center of gravity for them is up here. So we try to keep and create a culture that is very different from what is um, the organization and the, the mass of what we do well down there, um, a little bit different. So orbiting the hairball, very, very important. Because in the middle, in the minute you're in the middle, you get nothing done. Now, for those of you who feel that the hairball is a rather unfortunate image, because it is for many people, think of it as consciously uncoupling. So consciously uncoupling, and I don't know if you're familiar with the phrase, but this is our friend um, Gwyneth and, uh, his name is, thank you, Chris Martin. 
I'm sorry. Uh, yes. So he, they have agreed. They've not divorced, but they've consciously uncoupled. So they've agreed to live together. They're part of each other's lives. There's mutual respect. There's long-standing love, but they don't physically. They're not part of each every moment um, with each other as a couple. And that's really what what we have to do in innovation is. You are still together. We are forever tethered to what the main business is doing, and you need to know what are the pressures that they're living, what do they need to deliver, is it about margin, is it about top line, what is it about that we are in service to, but you just need to be that little bit of distance. So, uh, I'd like to think we are these people. <laughs> I know it's a bit of a stretch. Um, bring the outside in, and this is really where a lot of lean enterprise principles actually play themselves out, uh, you know, very, very easily. By bringing the outside in, there's a couple things. One, it's talent. So um, you may, as a startup or a small organization, make sure that your, you know, your base of talent, you have diversity of skills, etc. You can do that in a big corp as well. Um, if you think about a product that's extruded, for example, so something that's like literally, you know, uh, there are other industries that do it. Pet food does it. He does it, molding does it, candles do it. So just because you haven't had someone who has done exactly what you're about to try for the first time, you probably have people that have worked in different industries in the past and can bring that, that insight, crack the box. It's a different way of thinking. They're like, hey, well, we were in this industry, we looked at it this way. So that diversity of thought bringing the outside in um, is, uh, is very important and it's very easy in a big company, so that's good. Um, the second is um, market insight. You need to bring in market insight. The reason is when you are in your small bubble of what you are controlling, you are very concerned about that very small world. So my favorite example of this is when we were craft, it was um, we, we are 98% of the, of the um, processed cheese category. I was like, 98%? That's awesome. It's like, who else is in the, the processed cheese category? That would be cheese whiz. Um, they're like, well, we have a few five layer players. I'm like, well, what about the cheese category? We don't buy that data. <laughs> well, that's awesome because the world of cheese is changing around you, and we know what we're doing, and we're doing it really well, and it makes everybody feel really good to put a big pie chart that says 98%, but it doesn't tell you what else is happening out there. So when you look to buy your market industry studies, etc., make sure that your frame of reference is relevant and it isn't too myopic. Because if you don't, if you don't span that, you could find yourself feeling really freaking good about your little pie, but the whole game has changed. Nobody's even eating pie anymore. They're on the muffins in Europe. So you gotta, you gotta worry about that. Um, also, same thing is on, on, uh, on consumers. You talk about the consumers, you bring them in at the beginning, you're like, is it a good idea? And you vet it, and they say, yes, it is. And then you go off and you do a lot of work, and a product changes a lot, and what you told them was gonna be portable, but it's not really, and you told them it's gonna be this, it's not really. And you change it a lot, and then you go back to them and you say, and do you like the pack? And they're like, whoa. That is not at all what I said I liked back there. So you need to make sure that you're bringing the outside in all the way along. Because it seems like a nanosecond for you, or it seems like a small change to you, those things can be very material. So every time you find yourself making a change or a pivot point, bring your consumers back. We've been there. It's messy and it hurts because you're like, we thought we did, but we did all that. But you can't launch. It's not relevant. You're out. Back the door. Uh, back to the door. Um, the other thing are competitors. When you start, it's a white space. It's got a lot of need states. Folks are saying they really want it. There's nobody in there. You know, you're trying to be agile, but you're 24, 36 months in. And by the time you're, you know, month 18, there's five or six competitors already out there. And by the way, they're a lot better than the early entries that you saw when you first started. Or what you thought was a white space somebody else has got rid of them and they're already on shelf. So again, recalibrate. Continue. We have a lot of... You know, we're on the conference calls a lot of times, so I'll do I'll do phone calls literally in the in the you know convenience store, in the in the grocery store, just walking around. What are people looking at? What are they picking up? The number of iPhone shots of "Did you know?" That's where the pin drops. It's not in the office. So get out there. Um, don't uh, don't 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 make don't try to bring the outside in. Go out to the outside. So by that, if you're a startup, yes, you might be. Um, living with uh, that technology or, or the emerging world, then go back into the mainline world and go, whoa, I'm a little out of touch from who I want. I think wants to buy the product. Just make sure that you are um, pushing and living uh, the world that you know your product is going to live. What's next? Okay, this is another one that would have probably been censored. Keep the C-suite very close. So um, whoever your CEO, COO, whoever is in charge needs to be highly invested in what you're putting out there. And a lot of times, innovation as part of companies 
sometimes can roll up under functional divisions. We're lucky it doesn't, it rolls up into our president. If it didn't, you can have somebody invested in your idea, but not everybody. So the first thing that's gonna get cut is someone who's not invested and doesn't know what they're doing. They're like, I don't know what Bob does every day, but it can't be that important because I haven't heard anything about it, so I'm out. Um, or if they don't, they, they, they want to be engaged in what is going to be a big idea, so if they haven't been invested in the beginning, they're going to find lots of reasons to challenge um, more vigorously than if they've been invested. So this is where you have to be really, really sharp and tight with all of your functional leaders, your sales, your marketing, your CEO, at, at points where you think it's too early. I want to come with the reveal. I want to come when I've solved it. Not good. Come with the, here's the consumer need. Here's what consumers don't have, and here's our path to get them. Every time you have a win, bring them in, bring them in, bring them in. Because if you don't, um, you can be all the way down the line, but they're the ones that have to sign a check with the $75 million line, and if they're not in, it's all for naught. So keep them very, very close. Not inappropriately close. Um, but <laughs> we can't, but that's true. Um, fifth is make a bet, just not the ranch. So feels, again, kind of obvious, but you can, it feels very good and very safe, and the numbers look really good when you do things you've always done. So we have two businesses. We have uh, the base business, which does line extensions, flavor extensions, things that look and feel very similar to your original, and then you have innovation, which is more breakthrough, which is supposed to be a little bit different, and it's a different time orientation. You can really, you can launch an Oreo, and it can be 100 million bucks tomorrow. Whoa, well, why don't we just do a lot of flavors? Why don't we just keep doing that? You can't do that because that's not incremental. That's not actually going to grow your business. That's just going to get people trading, and it's not going to get you to those big step change. You're not going to get from 2% growth to 8% growth by just doing a lot of those things. So you have to lean out. You have to take a bet, um, but you have to be uh, prepared not to base, put all your money in one pot. So um, when you're talking about betting and when you're talking about innovation, um, you know we talk about a pipeline. So. Sometimes when you uh, put a lot of products in front of people and say, hey, here's my, here's my pipeline of products, they expect all of those to end up being spit out of the other end. And if it doesn't, then that's failure. I think what we need to embrace is, no, it's not failure. You have, making a good bet is not putting it all on one number. It's actually playing a number of different hands at the same time. So that's very important. So don't go, if you think this is the, the end all and the be all, just be cautious if, if you've played all of your hand in one shot because that is not inherently um, what, what precedent would say is, is going to play out in the end. 90% of the products launched don't, are not around in five years from now, 90%. So if you're only going with one, you're not hedging your bets very much. So just something to, something to consider. This is not a self-portrait. Um, <laughs> But this is about being agile and pivot often. So this really comes back to the first point about embracing uncertainty. This is about making changes constantly, getting the signals from what are your customers wanting, what are the competitors doing, what are you seeing are the trends, and changing, changing your course, and even if it hurts, and even if it means a lot of sunk costs get put aside, it's rethinking in the moment and pivoting. And if you are pivoting, you also need to invest, folks, because people have been along kind of since the beginning, and if you keep changing, keep, keep changing things um, without the proper rationale, you lose people. They go, you know what, you don't even know what you're doing. So you need to make the change, but then invest people in why making the change so that you can have people um, there with you at the finish line. Um, this is make it personal, and this might be very specific to a big company, but um, I talked a little bit before about, you know, a typical life cycle of a product can be 36 months. Nobody's in the same job for 36 months. So what can happen is you get a product and you go, okay, I get it. This is you know, Fred's product. I didn't really like Fred, and I don't even think it's a good idea, but I'm doing it, and it's mine, and I'll get it done. And if you don't sweat it like it's your own, if you don't own it, if you don't stand up, and you're not able to defend it, then you shouldn't have the product. So the good, the, the advice here is really just make it personal. When I ask folks to say, defend to me why you want to be launching this product, um, uh, it's amazing the answer they get. Well, they're like, well, I, Apparently, someone said, I saw the number that said this. I'm like, you don't even believe it yourself. So why are you selling it? Um, but they can easily give you a PowerPoint of all the reasons to launch the product. But if I said, you're, you're going to stand up in the, pres the president and say, um, why we need to launch this? The answer changes. Like, well, now I need to do my homework. I'm like, wow, that's the same question, except I'm just asking you to deliver it. So um, kind of a small thing, um, but really has played, it, uh, played, out, to, played out quite true. Um, I don't think this fish made it the first time. I don't know what, I don't want to talk about what happened when he didn't, but, um, you know, 
you have to expect to fail. And you have to know that failure is not failure in the sense that um, you, know, you did something wrong. It could mean that you did something right. So if everything that you started out on landed to the end, and you know that 90% of the products aren't there in five years, you actually, the failure was actually getting out of there in the first place. Think about the, the, the organizational energy and resources spent to launch things that had no business being in market. So the challenger market is challenge, continue to say, is this right? What am I missing? I like to think about it like the captain of a ship. You know, you're going along, it's an open ocean. He's not looking for everything to be clear. He's looking for those things that he's not expecting to find. What, what am I not expecting to find? Where, could, where is my potential pitfall? So as innovation advocates, that's our job. Where's the iceberg that I didn't see? Where's the island that I, you know? So that, um, that I think is important. And this one's very serious. Very serious. Uh, and that is have fun. Because it is hard being in innovation, particularly in a big company. Because you've got a lot of people saying no all the time. I'm like, let me guess. It's going to be no. Right. OK. So you are always on the cell. You are always challenging. You're trying to tear down your own idea. So it can be a bit of a, you know, a, bit of a burden. So it's not going to be fun every day. We're not talking beach, bags, <coughs> beach balls in the hall. But, but think about what, you, what you're doing. You're creating growth. And um, you have to have fun with what you're doing. So don't take it personally. Just think of it as, as, as uh, kind of what the job demands. Failure is part of the job. Don't look at it as, as something that you have done wrong, but something that you've done right. So try to keep a positive face and spin on things. And you know, you only live once, uh, I think is important. I'm not sure we have fun every day, but we try. Um, <laughs> but keeping that levity in the group and in the culture of innovation is really important, because otherwise you can find yourself burdened by you know, the pace of things and things that are not getting right because uh, you don't have those day-to-day -day celebrations. You don't get your, your, you don't make your month end. You don't make your whatever. Your, your success today may not actually be materialized until three years from now and someone else is celebrating with a glass of champagne. So you need to take um, note of that and have fun uh, in the moment. So that's that. Um, so if there's three things, there's 10. If there's three, I'd say know your problem because if you don't know your problem, you don't have anything to sell, no one's going to buy it. Very important. Second is orbit. Do not get sucked into the larger part of the organization. And if you're in there, just try to pull back and try to get that perspective. Because only if you do everything the way it's done before, you're not going to be creating incremental growth. And the third is pivot. So be prepared to change. Look for those changes when you need to make it. Um, and go from there. So that's it. Not rocket time. Stay around to yeah, answer yeah. any questions yeah, yeah. after Absolutely. that. Cool. All right. So, does anyone have any questions? If not, I, I do. I have lots of questions. Yeah. And if you can, before you have, uh, say your question, uh, your name and where and where you work and where you're coming from. Um, so, so, so I'm David, and I work for a small product development company. Um, when you're when you're developing a new product and you want to test the market before you go too far on the development. Mm -hmm. Do you ever launch a product to the market under a pseudonym? So that if it's a big failure, no one says, Kraft really you know, like, took a hose on that one. Do you, or do you just use, uh, do you just use um, New groups, product. focus groups? Yeah, we, we, not just focus groups, we do a lot of different things, but no, we don't typically do that. It's just, again, the army is into making big things. Even a test market would be very difficult to manage. Once you've turned it on, you're like fire hose. There's no, like, turn on the tap and turn it off. So, um, so no, I can see that being, you know, useful in other, um, other categories. No, we would look to their marker products. You start to see, we get, you know, early data on trends and what we see growing in other categories and would use those as markers, but we wouldn't, <coughs> typically uh, do it ourselves. Do you guys have any? Uh, yeah. Did that help? Yeah. Oh, oh. curiosity. Oh, okay. yeah. um, my name is Joyce. I work for a really boring place, so I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> but are you hiring? Because yeah, Joyce is looking for something that. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Out of curiosity, what was, you say the problem for Oreo is? The problem the for problem Oreo is solving. 
Uh, for some people, well, does every who eats Oreos? Yeah. Who doesn't eat Oreos? So that's where you start. Okay, you don't eat Oreos. Why don't you eat Oreos? Uh, it's unhealthy. It's unhealthy. Okay, so that's one problem. How many lab? How many people are concerned with the health of you know or the nutritional profile of Oreos? And we there's only one of you. So sadly, he probably wouldn't make the list. You're probably not going to see healthy uh, Oreo anytime soon. Anybody else who doesn't eat Oreo? Yeah. Same reason. Same reason. Yeah, same. same? Ah. So someone has. There's actually you can buy a product that is not um, by Mondelez, but is a is a healthy Oreo basically. The kicker is it doesn't taste. Like so, you know, there's, there's, but they're willing for compromise. You can do smaller Oreos, you can do bigger Oreos, you can have cream, people who want more cream or there's too much biscuit. So, um, there's, people are, people are very precious about what they want as an Oreo. In fact, there is, the penetration of Oreo in the U.S. is greater than toothbrushes. I shared that with someone earlier, I thought that was fascinating, but that's true. Um, but yet, we have, but every year there's hundreds of millions of dollars in new product development. So people are looking for variety, um, but there's always, a, there's always something. Yeah. There seems to be a contradiction between orbiting at all costs mm -hmm. and keeping your executive suite close. Mm -hmm. Is there you, tension there? You can call it a tension, you can call it a contradiction, but yes. how do you... How do you straddle that chasm of keeping distance while maintaining intimacy? Uh, I would say through relationships. So, um, if you think about my, so my boss would be the president of Biscuit, and she's responsible for seeing the whole thing grow. But she's also not. She's also going to be responsible for that next year. So you have to appeal to the side that says. Let's not, let's not let today's short-term orientation mortgage what you're gonna need in April from now. So you just need to be very close and be very sharp in, in, in convincing in needing to hold on to scarce resources and invest them for something that they're not gonna see return on in this, in this year. So it's a balance. So I've done everything from, you know, I'll give you this, but I just need this. Or I've done this and I'm gonna play it, I'm gonna pull it. So you've given me this, you've given me an inch and I'm actually gonna take a yard because I know you're gonna need that later. So part of it is just, um, it, it is the relationships. Um, it, is, it, it is making the compelling case for continued growth, which is gonna be there, you know, at the end of the day, that's what they need. And thirdly, it's just being sharp about kind of the project. You own the resources on the day to day, so how are you going to employ them? They might say, I only want this, but you know they don't really just want that. You know they're gonna come back with something in December, so you need to make sure that you've already answered for that, you've already thought about it. Um, so, I don't know if that answers it, but that's the relationship that people can do it. Yes, hi. Hi, my name is Krista, and I'm with Interactive Ontario, so I represent IBM within the province. Um, one of the questions for you would be, as you innovate, and you have these, you know, great brands that have personalities, like mm -hmm. just a one or four, you know, and there's a bingeability, you know, aspect to it, how much of that are you looking outside of traditional advertising and looking at you know, apps and gamification and brand placement? Uh, I have some, we have some brand folks here that might want to. Do you guys want to take this question? You're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know what, I am a marketer, but in terms of what it's we huge. are doing today, it's, it's huge. It is huge. Um, it's not the subject of where we're, do you guys want to talk about a specific example? We can live? talk maybe Minor. after. After? Okay. I'll tell you. Yeah, you can you can come find you? Yeah. I'll also find you. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, I'm Catherine, I'm from Alliance Data, I love to win. Um, similar question to the gentleman at the front. I'm curious how you negotiate um, the, the conflict between orbiting, yep. getting really personally invested, making it personal, yep. uh, but then keeping it light. Right. Yes. It's hard. Um, <laughs> it's not a science, it's an art. Sometimes it's not always, it's not always good that they always like what you're doing. So, um, and my boss has said many times, she likes the tension, she likes that, she wants to see the challenge, she wants to see, you know, the base business having one view and us having another, and that is, Sometimes one wins out, sometimes another wins out, but you really don't, you don't want to make it personal in terms of the it, you know, whatever the, the, the subject is or the product, that's, that's not personal. You need to still be able to connect on a, you know, on a relationship, on an individual level, um, but you don't make the project personal. Mm -hmm. So 
I think it comes down to just holding, acting with a, a respect and assuming um, positive intent. And if you do that, and then you make it about the business, I think it can diffuse a lot of that, you know, pressure. Yeah, but it, it is it is not a science, and it isn't always happy. You're always stressed, but um, at the end of the day, you need to be able to, you know, maintain those relationships. Do I have a question? Yeah. Um, so say you know your problem, yep. and you find out your problem. And you just start a good start. Cool. And then uh, the next step, right, maybe is, is something around strategy. Like, do you guys use different models or tools? Like, would you use, like, a Porter's or, like, a Blue Ocean strategy canvas or, like, business model canvas? Like, how do you start to organize all of that, you know, quantitative or qualitative data that you guys are getting and put into, like, a structured format? Or do you do that? We do do that, and we have armies of different organizations and, and functional groups that do that, which is the good news. Um, but all the best organization or strategy starts with the consumer. So the most powerful tool we have is the ethnography. So you go into your consumer's home or you go to the bar or you go to wherever it is they're consuming your product or your competitive product and you see how they use it, what is their unmet need. Then we work with different agencies that can help overlay. So um, you know, we have, a, I have an innovation land, uh, roadmap which says these are the hot spots. Or, these are the things that I feel like we're going to be growing in the next, not I myself, but the market says are, are indicators of growth for the next um, three to five years. Those are a composite of trending. So I always look at trending. So futurists and those things are real. Uh, flavor houses, which tell you what you know, what's happening through restaurants, what's happening through you know, various different things. So those, those kind of marry into the, the pie. But at the core of it all is 10,000 consumers. And for us, it's globally. So what are people eating in China and in India and in North America? And, and it's amazing how they all kind of point to the same direction. Uh, and we know in time how to predict and how, how long things take to catch up. So Mexican might be very big in Canada. It's not very big in the U.S. And if you think about, we don't, ex or sorry, big in the U.S. and not being very big in Canada. And India might be big here, but not there. So you kind of try to do the, you can do the overlay and, and marry it. But um, the best is, is, is really looking at the consumers and how they shop and what they're doing. And that really is the part. Everything else just layers on top. And you don't need to go into someone's home. You can do it online. Like online panels are a huge thing. We have something called Communispace, which is a consumer so you can go back to uh, time and time again more efficiently. Um, but even your own friends, your network, um, people here, this could be a focus group. You know, how would you lead Oreo? You all did. So you know what? We're, we're getting close, and it didn't cost us um, uh, you know, an arm and a leg. So, uh, so keep the consumer close. Yeah. Uh, how long can you tell us? Yeah. But um, I just want to ask you a simple question. How do you guys measure the success of innovation? Success? If you're feeling all the time, what is considered successful? Well, the organization would be success is a percentage of your net rev, so over a three year period. So, you know, are you accelerating growth? For us, we have other metrics. Um, we know that. Um, specific on numbers, but a lot of our growth is going to be innovation, so I know what that number is, and that becomes, you know, it doesn't say it has to come from this project or that project, but overall, are we an engine that's getting things out that are driving incremental growth, um, yay or nay, and two, um, we have other metrics like margin, so are we making more or less money? Um, that's another thing that's really, really hard in a CPG, because you get your organization done things down, and whittled to a, a point of efficiency, which is lower cost, and then you try to break that model and everything instantly becomes more expensive. So margin is another metric. If we can get something that is actually profitable and doesn't bring our company down, that is also a measure of success. And I would say team happiness is, is a metric too. Like if people are miserable, we're not doing something right. Um, retention. So it's all the sort of basic corporate metrics, but as a, you know, overall it would typically be percentage in that right. Your, your first one, know your problem. Mm -hmm. Once the problem is identified, you can solve it. How do you know? Sometimes. Well, <coughs> yeah. but you, you can always solve it, whether it's feasible with time, Fair. money, or whatever. It, 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 that's a separate yeah. discussion. But <coughs> when you're in innovation, you're it, truly embracing uncertainty. I, I, I like that idea, but how do you know that the problem you've identified mm -hmm. is the right problem to tackle. There's an infinite number of potential problems that you can address. You're going to address a very 
infinitesimal <laughs> right. subset of that. So how do you decide what your problem is, or how do you know when you found the right problem to try, to even try and solve? Right. Well, you've chosen Sorry, your... I, no, Leslie no, no. and I from Telus, I forgot to identify. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, the anonymous front row question. That's right. <laughs> no, um, well, we have, like I said, you have a roadmap, so you've, you've already identified the hot spot. So you're, you know, it's not, there's not a single idea typically for it to be a hot spot, for something to be an area of interest. You know that you could be. You don't have to be in the, in the volcano. You can kind of be outside the volcano. It's still kind of warm. So if you're pl you're playing in the right sandbox, that's the first thing. So know your roadmap. Know you want to fly. Now you've isolated the area. We do testing that um, you know is is quite specific. You can put if you if you think about the number of dimensions on a product like uh, a Chips Ahoy, you have your packaging, you have your price point, you have your ingredients, you have your flavors, uh, you have your size, like your ounce weight. And if you marry up just on that, there can be over 25,000 different combinations of what that proposition could be like in market. 25,000. And if you do it, typically less than 100 will say, this is a winning product. So it is a science. And for us, if you have the access to it, you actually make it a bit of a mathematical exercise. You go, what is going to maximize my chances of success? So play the numbers. Yeah. And then you whittle it down. Um, and, and, and go from there. So you get a size of price. So we do a lot of volumetric work. You're not going to launch something unless you know um, the, the appeal is out there. So there's a number of different tools, and that's where we use lots of fresh new tools coming on the market. Um, you know, but basically, you do, you do your due diligence, um, start with the right area, and then sweat it down and prove it out. So that's where a lot of things fail. You get it all the way down, you've got prototypes, you're all the way there, and you put it through the numbers, and they go, eh, but not enough people like it. It's still a great product for a lot of people, but not enough. So it's back to the dark, and that will be something that gets kicked, gets kicked up. All right, so we're going to wrap it up there. Uh, Andrew, we're we'll sticking around. If you have any more questions, feel free to come up. Uh, we have two winners quickly for the books. Uh, first winner is Katarina Kiss. Katarina. Katarina.